Hi everybody, I'm Morgan. Today I'm going to be teaching you how to make a read from start to finish. And this includes um, all the processes, so uh, profiling and shaping and scraping as well um, to make a finished read. So throughout there's going to be many machines and tools that many of you may have never seen before and um, I'll be explaining every machine and every tool and why they're used and um, please keep in mind that everything throughout this process can be changed depending on your teacher or your own personal taste so this is just the way that I personally make reads so please enjoy so I thought I would just start off by giving a physical uh, view of cane and reeds from start to finish and I'll be going into depth with each one of these processes, but I just wanted to give a general overview. So this is gouged bassoon cane, and I'll explain what that means. This is gouged and shaped bassoon cane. This is gouged, shaped, profiled, and scored cane. And this is a forming reed, so this is a forming pin and it's just wrapped around the pin, and I'll explain more later. This is a blank, so after it's all wrapped with wires and wrapped with thread. Um, and then this is a finished and scraped bassoon reed. So I'll explain how we go from here to here. So a lot of people ask me if what I play on to play bassoon is bamboo. And the answer I always say is it's kind of like bamboo. Obviously this looks like bamboo. This is a strain of cane called Arundo Donax. That's the Latin name for it. It literally just means giant reed, um, although it doesn't look like a reed yet, but it, um, once the greenery and leaves are shaved off, it looks like this, and these are tubes of cane. And people can buy cane like this. They can buy it in any process um, of this that I showed previously. Um, it's very rare to find people that start all the way from this far back in the process. So. Once you have tubed cane, you have to split it, and they sell splitters. Um, as you can see, it's really expensive, so I don't uh, buy that. But once you split the cane, as you can see here, it's pretty thick, um, whereas this piece is really thin. So that's what they call gouging, and you need a machine for it, which I don't own, and I'll explain how it works. So you put this piece of cane um, ungouged in here. You crank this thing back and this whole, oh, this whole apparatus moves backwards. And you place the piece of cane right there in, in there and then push the whole thing forward so that it pushes the cane through here. And this is a blade and it basically shaves off about half of the, half of the um, size of the cane. So once you have your gouged piece of cane, this is what I normally buy, um, the next thing that you're gonna wanna do to it is to shape it. And throughout this whole process, I'm going to be introducing you to tools and machines that help with the reed making process. So this is called a shaper, and it's just a little machine that clamps the gouged piece of cane in and you shave away the excess cane. So I'll show you now. It, as you can see, it's I, it's an identical curve, um, so it fits the shape of the cane. So we fit it in there, like so, and then making sure that it's pretty even on both sides so that we get a good middle cut. Like that, and then clamp it down. nice and tight, like that. And then I'm going to take my reed knife here. This is just a Landwell reed knife. Um, I'm gonna take it and shave off the excess. Um, this is just a rough first cut. I will go flush to the, um, the shaper in a little bit. So let me just do a, a rough first cut. Pieces kind of fly everywhere, so watch your eyes. And 
And so now I'm going to use just a regular razor blade to make it more flush to the shaper. And what I do is a lot of people will just take it and you know do the same thing that I did with the knife. But what I like to do, what I have a problem of doing is when I do it just like I did with the knife, it cuts in to the shape and it screws up the shape a bit. So what I like to do is kind of counteract that and go opposite just in about an inch or so. And making sure it's flush to the shaper on all four sides. That way I have little to no chance of botching the shape. And then I'm just going to do what I would have done in the first place, so taking the razor blade and doing what I did with the knife. Just making it flush to the shaper. Another thing that I should point out is uh, I like to do this process dry because I think that it's easier to use with this. Uh, the, the fiber of the cane is a little bit denser when dry, so it's easier to get a really close shape. Some people like to do it wet or soaked because they have a different type, type of shaper and this is what's called a straight shaper because it's straight and you have basically one straight shot. There's also another shaper called a foldover shaper which is basically like this but it's just half, it's just this half and you fold over the piece of cane around it and, and shape it like that. Um, so it needs to be soft and malleable so that it can be folded. But I like to do it dry and with a straight shaper because I think I get better results. So after we're, we're done doing that, take it out of the shaper. And now we have a piece of gouged and shaped cane. And we're ready to move on to the next process, which is profiling. This cane has been soaking um, for a while. So this is a profiling process. This is the actual profiler itself. It has this little handle thing and the blade is here. And this is what's called the barrel. Um, it has these little lines here, as you can see. So what you do is you take a piece of gouged and shaped cane and you line it up with the lines like so. And then take these clips and clip it on. Like that. Line it up in the other end. Put it on. Clip there so that it's strapped in, it won't move anywhere. Then you put it in a little holster, like so and take it and like this. And as you can see, it's taking big shards of, uh, of cane off and you can adjust the blade to, uh, to take just the right amount of cane off. So I'll just do that for you now. You don't want to do it all in one go um, because it's just better to do it gradually. Um, switching from side to side. So I usually just do side by side until it won't take any more off.
seems like that's pretty good. You just kind of rub off the excess. And here we have a gouge shaped and now profiled piece of cane. And you can see, I don't know if you can, let me see if I can show you here. You can see that it has, oh well, I can't really show you. Um, yeah, I can't show you. Um, it should have a profile to it. That means if you were to hold it up to the light, you could see, you can kind of see here. You can see that it's more see-through here and it should be thicker all throughout the spine. And I'll explain the um, characteristics of the blade of a reed later. So there's a profile piece of cane. Now I'm gonna show you the scoring process. <coughs> so as you can see, this is uh, basically naked cane. There's no marks in it or anything. And if we were to form it like we did in one of the previous videos, um, it, it has a higher chance of cracking through the blade than with no scoring. So I'll show you how I score. So I put it on the easel here. Now I'm gonna sit down to show you. So I like to do crosshatch first. So I take my razor blade and I go like so. Holding it steady. Then I do the other side. Like that. There's your crosshatch scoring. And some people just stop there or they don't do crosshatch scoring at all. Some people just do vertical, which is what I'm gonna do now. And there's my vertical. Then I'll do that to the other side. Doesn't have to be an exact science, just so you're making marks in the actual cane so it doesn't crack. I'll do my vertical. And there we have a gouged, shaped, profiled, and scored piece of cane. And now the next process would be forming. So the next process is called forming, and that's when we take the piece of gouged, shaped, profiled, and scored cane, um, and we soak it for a bit so that it's nice and soft, and um, we form it so that this end goes from being uh, flat to oval to being circular so that it, it's able to fit on the bogle when we play it. So the process of doing that is we take this soaked piece of cane and we fold it over and it already has that mark in it. And as you can see, it's not <laughs> round and it won't fit on a bocal. So we have to get it to fit on the bocal. So the tools we're going to use for this, this is a forming mandrel and it's like a little uh, holding thing. And then this is a forming pin. And these come in many shapes and sizes. I think I got these from millermarketing.com. I like them because they're long and they have this little line. Some of them don't have lines. Um, and that's what I like to push my reeds to so that they can dry. So I'm gonna put this in there, tighten it, and then I'll have that ready. And then I'm going to use wire. Wire is used to wrap the reeds. And I'm only going to be using one piece of wire because I don't need all three to do this forming process. So I'm going to take my first piece of wire. This is, I think, uh, 22 gauge wire. It just comes on a spool like this. I've just cut off a, a pre-measured slice. So I'm going to take this wire and wrap it around. And the way you wrap, well, the way I wrap, is I put it underneath, hold it there, kind of push it over, and wrap around and then crisscross the wires like so and take my pliers. These are pliers. Um, every reed maker should have them. And you can just need needle nose. You can do flat nose, needle nose, it doesn't really matter. And I take it and I pull and twist to the left. Some twist to the right. 
doesn't really matter, just personal preference. And then that looks pretty messy, so I'm going to fix it and put it into position. And I like to position it basically one millimeter away from the collar. This is the collar. We'll go into realms of the reed a little bit later when we get into scraping. So then I'm going to put it on the forming pin and as you can see it's it doesn't want to go but we're going to force it to go. So I'm going to take this and tighten it even more so that it's not going anywhere. Just pull and twist, pull and twist, twist some more. That way the wire is really tight. And then I'm going to take this, which is butcher twine. Some people use twine, some people use string, some people use rubber bands for this process. I just use butcher twine because, I don't know, I like it. So I wrap it preemptively just around the wire and kind of crudely down the tube. Like so. And this doesn't need to be at all in place. So in order for it to form to the circular shape of the forming pin, we're just going to shove it all the way down to the line there. And then in order for it to keep its shape um, and to prevent cracks while forming, while drying, I take my pliers and I crush it. Like so. And then I'll kind of readjust this, take it back a little bit. I like to crush it even more, just so it really holds its shape. And then really tightly wrap it so that it definitely holds its shape. And the way that I keep the butcher twine from not moving as I wrap it. So you're going to take the excess and then move it up. Then I put my finger here, wrap it around my finger. Oh, that's too short. Wrap it around my finger. So we have the little loop there. Take my finger out, put the slack through the hole, and pull it through around on itself like so. Then we have a forming reed, and some people um, will form their reeds for five days to five months. It definitely comes down to personal preference. I get really impatient and run out of reeds really quickly and also really like the wrapping process, which is the next process. So I only let mine hold for, I think, five to 10 days. So this is the longest process of the reed making process. Um, so I'm gonna let this sit. I'm gonna put it on this forming rack. You can see that there are other forming reeds. And you just take out the pin and place it in the hole here. And then let that sit for however long you want. So uh, on to the next process. So now we're on to my favorite part of the reed making process, which is wrapping. The only thing that you're going to add from the process before is the actual thread. And there are so many different colors and gauges of thread that you can use. This is just one that I got from Midwest Musical Imports, I think it's called pomegranate. And so what we're going to do is wrap it. And people like to wrap in different ways. They either start from the bottom to the top or top to the bottom. I like to uh, do top to bottom. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put the end here, hold it with my thumb, wrap it around the bottom of the second wire around itself a couple times to make sure it holds. Then push it up like so, make sure it's tight. And then wrap all the way down to the third wire. Once you get down to the third wire, just kind of go over it and past it all the way down to the base. I leave a little 
bit of room at the base. Then I start going up and I'm going to create what's called a turban, which it literally just, the reason why it's called a turban is because it looks like a turban. So go a little bit past the third wire and create a mass in the middle so that it looks like a turban. This is also my favorite color, I think, by the way. And then for the prettiest part of it, um, I don't really know what to call it, I guess cross, patch, I don't really know the pattern. You start from the top, go down to the bottom, back up to the top, and just follow that pattern, like so. If it gets a little tangled here, you can always undo it. Sometimes it gets a little frustrating doing this because it'll move, but for the most part, it's really fun. Some people uh, either leave their reeds naked, so nothing on it at all except for nail polish or duco or whatever you're using. Some people prefer hot glue, some people prefer wrapping. I am a huge fan of the aesthetic of wrapping, so I'm just going to continue wrapping them. So once you have that done, you're going to go back up to the top and um, go up a little bit. And then the way that I tie it off is I, it's like this little fancy knot process. So I take the slack, I put my hand underneath, and I flip it like so, so there's that, and then I put the reed, place it on the second wire around the reed itself and pull the extra so that it creates a knot similar to the one that I used when I was uh, wrapping the butcher twine. Sometimes it gets a little stuck down all the way there and pull and then it's holding by itself. And then I'm going to take a scalpel here. Let me just get it out. Here's just a regular scalpel. You can get it on Amazon. Hold it underneath and like that, it separates. But I, I like to use the scalpel end to just really make these lines super nice and aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> like so. And then that is a wrapped reed. And I'm going to put a layer of nail polish on, again, just so it holds. And I'm running low on nail polish, so I'm just twist, I'm tilting it so that I get more nail polish. Like that. And then just do this all the way around the reed so that it holds. And again, with this process, some people like to use duco or resin or nail polish. I used to use Duco. It's quick, it's easy, and it lasts really long, but I secretly really like the smell of nail polish, and I think it has a shinier look to it, so I've just been using nail polish for a while. The only problem is that it really doesn't last that long. So you just have to keep restocking on nail polish, but I think I'm a little bit addicted to the smell. So I'm probably not gonna stop anytime soon. Just really glob it on there. Let it soak.
so once we let this dry, it will be a finished blank. And from that point forward, we it's now considered a reed. Well, basically as soon as you cut the tip, it's considered a reed, but it looks like a reed. The only thing that's needed, that's left, is we need to cut the tip and scrape the blade. So, moving on to that process. So, this is a finished blank that's been in my box for a while, so I think it's time that I turn it into an actual reed. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the slack with my wire cutters. And through the drying process, these wires have um, become a little loose, especially the top ones, so we don't want that. So the thing is, we want to tighten it, but in the process that I'm going to be using, I'm going to end up tightening them anyway. So I'm just going to leave them loose for now, and I'm going to put them down. And then I'm going to use this tool, which is called a tip cutter, and I have to use it, I don't know if you can see that, yeah, I uh, have to use it here, because you can use it, you can put it on the mandrel like that, I don't know, I've never really liked doing it. I also call this a guillotine, because it reminds me of a guillotine. So you're going to put it on here, and right here there are measurements of how long you want the blade, it depends on your teacher's preferences or your own personal preference. I like to cut mine to about 27 and a half. So I'm going to line up the collar. This is the collar here with the 27 or 27 and a half. And line it up so it's straight and cut the tip. And now this is considered a reed. Although it won't play because the the blade is too thick. So the next process is going to be soaking it up and tip profiling it. 